Marriage is supposed to be a sacred and happy union, but in modern times, only about 58% of marriages in the US last, with as many as 86 couples getting divorced every hour. We unfortunately seem to live in a new culture where everything is disposable, including relationships with someone who's supposed to be your lifelong best friend. Now, a great deal of these marriages end on good terms, but for some, not so much. This is painfully true in the case of Anna Walsh, who simply wanted a fresh start in life, but unfortunately, what she got was far more sinister. Thirty-nine-year-old Anna Walsh was born in Belgrade, Serbia, and after graduating from high school, she attended the University of Belgrade, where she obtained a French Language and Literature Bachelor of Arts. She would remain in the country until 2005, when she decided to seek a better life in the United States. She moved to Washington, where she found work at a luxury inn, aptly called the Inn at Little Washington. And in time, she successfully applied for dual citizenship here in the States. Now, later on, she relocated to Massachusetts, where she started working at Wheatley Hotel in Lenox. And here, she happened to meet a man named Brian Walsh. The two hit it off very quickly, with Anna and Brian getting married in 2016 and very quickly having three children. Anna would go on to work in a few more hotels, but settled well in her position at a real estate firm called Tishman Speyer. But unbeknownst to her, Brian had been up to no good behind her back, conducting fraudulent business deals, and his actions were about to catch up with him. It all started when a man stumbled across an eBay listing for two Andy Warhol paintings from his Shadows collection that the artist created back in 1978. The price for both of these paintings was $100,000, and since the listing contained the original purchase receipts for a total of $240,000, he jumped at the chance of owning two pieces that most art collectors could only dream of. He contacted Walsh, and the two bartered over the price, eventually settling on a total of $80,000. A contract was drawn up stating that the man had three days to study the paintings, and if he was dissatisfied, he could return them for a full refund. The man sent his assistant to pick up the paintings from Walsh in Boston on the 7th of November and the sale was made. Walsh immediately deposited the $80,000 check into his bank account, and over the next two weeks, he withdrew just over $33,000 of that money. The following day, the buyer had a chance to study the paintings properly by removing the frames, but he was surprised to learn that neither contained the customary Warhol Foundation authentication stamps. Furthermore, he became suspicious that the paintings might be fakes when he noticed that the staples used to affix them to the canvas looked brand new, which would not have been the case had they been added in 1978. You could certainly expect a bit of tarnishing and rust after all that time. Worried that he may have been duped, he took a closer look at the paintings in the eBay listing, and he immediately started noticing glaring differences. Luckily, he'd drawn up the contract with Walsh, and he knew that he could get his money back since it was still within the allotted three-day viewing period. But it wouldn't be that easy. His first few attempts to contact Walsh failed, and when he eventually reached him, Walsh had all sorts of excuses that delayed the refunding of the money. It's then that the full picture of Walsh's deceit would be uncovered. An investigation found that Walsh had first seen the original Warhol paintings at a friend's house while he was visiting South Korea. Realizing just how valuable these pieces were, Walsh told the friend that he could find a buyer who would pay top dollar for the historic pieces, and in 2011, he sold them to an art gallery. They would eventually be sold to an unknown foreign buyer, and their current whereabouts remain unknown. But in 2011, Walsh happened upon a set of replicas that he then passed off as the originals, and they were sold to the man from France who bought them on eBay. The man would never get his money back, and eventually Walsh would be sentenced to three years and one month behind bars, and he would later be ordered to pay a total of $475,000 in restitution. Not sure how the price escalated from just $80,000 all the way to $475,000, but I guess this man had a really good lawyer. But by the time all was said and done, Brian Walsh would be accused of a far more serious crime, claiming the life of his wife. By New Year's Day of 2023, Anna had made a name for herself at the Tishman Spare and had achieved the position of real estate executive and regional general manager. But according to one of her family members, she called for a rideshare car to take her to Logan Airport, since she was heading back to her place in Washington. 
but she never got on the flight, and her family and friends were unable to reach her. When she still hadn't reported for work three days later, on the 4th of January, her boss decided to file a missing persons report. This is one of the first worrying signs in this case. It seems unthinkable that a husband could find out that his wife has gone missing, and then do nothing about it. But Brian Walsh seemed largely unconcerned, and waited until someone else from her workplace filed a report with the Cohasset Police Department. This wasn't a good look for Brian. The subsequent investigation found that Anna was actually meant to fly back to Washington on the 3rd of January, but she was contacted about an emergency at one of the properties that she managed, and had to change her plans to an earlier departure date. Investigators spoke to staff at the airport, and quickly learned that Anna never boarded her plane. Furthermore, they were unable to find any proof that she had called for a rideshare car, or that she'd ever set out for the airport in the first place. Six days after she had gone missing, a search of the woods near Anna's house was carried out with the assistance of search dogs, air wing units, as well as search and rescue crews. But no sign of her or any of her belongings was found, despite the area being scoured for two full days. The next step was to search Anna's rental home in Washington, but all that was found here was her car. It was as if she'd simply vanished into thin air without explanation. Investigators, determined to find out what happened to her, checked Anna's bank accounts, credit card, and phone activity, as well as her social media accounts, but learned that none of these had seen any activity since the day that she disappeared. When Brian was questioned, he stated that on the 1st of January, he'd been driving to his mother's house in Swampscott, but that he'd somehow lost his bearings, and before he knew it, he'd become lost. While this story made a small amount of sense, investigators just weren't buying it. To them, something seemed off. This led them to obtain a search warrant for the couple's home, and here, they uncovered some disturbing evidence that would begin to paint a clearer picture of what had happened that day. In the house's basement, they came across a knife that had blood on its blade, and furthermore, they found more blood on the floor. With this new evidence in hand, they decided to look into Brian's alibi that he'd been traveling that day, and it didn't take long to discover that he'd been lying. He never made this trip to his mother's house, but instead spent some time at a Home Depot store, where he bought around $450 worth of supplies, including duct tape and mops. I think you probably know where this is going from here. On the 6th of January, just days after the search took place, Firefighters were dispatched to the family's home after a fire was reported at about 2.15 p.m. Pretty convenient timing. When officers arrived at the property, they found it ablaze, but luckily no one was injured as Brian and the three children made it out safely. The cause of the fire was investigated, but eventually found to not be suspicious, yet it was certainly suspiciously convenient. Since Brian was very quickly found to have been lying about his whereabouts the day that Anna went missing, considering he was at Home Depot, not his mother's house, he was soon arrested and charged with misleading investigators. But he proved to be uncooperative and would not offer up any additional information, and he was held on a $500,000 bond. But this is where things get much, much worse, when the most damning piece of evidence of all was found. When a search of a waste disposal site located about an hour from the family's house was searched, Investigators found trash bags that contained blood as well as a hacksaw and a hatchet that had been disposed of. They also came across a rug and several different cleaning supplies, and it had now started to look as though Brian was not the man he made himself out to be. After his arrest, Brian Walsh claimed that he'd been to a CVS drugstore and a Whole Foods in Swampscott on the day that Anna went missing. But investigators were unable to find any CCTV security footage or any evidence that this was the case. Despite this, he entered a plea of not guilty. On the 18th of January, more charges were filed against him, including taking the life of his wife and, well, disposing of her, to put it nicely. When detectives continued to dig deeper, they found some disturbing internet searches that had been conducted on his son's iPad and they alleged that Brian was the one who used the tablet, since he was likely certain that investigators would have no cause to analyze their children's devices. Yet, they did. The searches included phrases of how long before a body starts to smell, the best way to dispose of a body, can you be charged without a body, and can you throw away body parts, as well as 10 ways to dispose of a body if you really need to. Even when this was presented as evidence, 
Brian maintained his innocence. Brian's case was damaged even further when it came to light that he'd made some serious threats against Anna in 2014, before they'd gotten married, and just after she divorced her first husband, Mark Nipp. In a phone call that lasted several minutes, he threatened to kill her and one of her friends for reasons unknown to investigators. Anna was asked to file charges against him, but she declined, and a year later they were married. And that's just so wild to me, I can't even imagine how that discussion must have played out and how Anna could have moved on from such serious threats, but to each their own, I guess. But getting back to the case at hand, some discrepancies were found in the police log regarding Anna's disappearance being reported. The log stated that the police were contacted by the head of security for Tishman Spare. This person had contacted Brian when Anna didn't show up for work as planned and was surprised to learn that he hadn't reported her missing yet. But the police log showed that the company and Brian filed missing person reports at the same time, which simply wasn't the case, and police knew this for a fact. So why did the documentation claim such a thing? Brian's attorney argued that Brian was the one who contacted the company when he couldn't get in touch with Anna, suggesting that the employee who made those statements was being untruthful or that he was simply mistaken. Brian and his lawyer claimed that the company only contacted the police after Brian made them aware of Anna's disappearance, even though this obviously wasn't true. The defense then asked that Brian be released on $250,000 bail, stating that it's the law in Massachusetts that a person can't be presumed deceased for at least seven years, since there's no law against willingly disappearing. They added that no body had been found despite extensive searches being carried out, and that no motive or weapon had been uncovered. But this wasn't quite true, as was soon revealed by the prosecution. The prosecution argued that Brian had grown suspicious of Anna in December, just weeks before she disappeared, since he'd started worrying that she was having an affair with another man. He'd grown so paranoid over this that he started accessing the Instagram page of one particular male friend of hers, and he'd convinced himself that she was getting ready to leave him. He discussed this situation with his mother, who then advised him to hire a private investigator, which he then did. But despite Brian's suspicions, the detective found no evidence that she'd been unfaithful, and essentially it was all in his head. The prosecution added that Anna had spoken to one of her friends and stated that she was considering ending the marriage after the whole situation came out about the Andy Warhol paintings. But she would obviously never be able to stick around to make this decision once and for all. Another friend told investigators that during a dinner meeting on the 28th of December, Anna had become uncharacteristically emotional, as she was certain that Brian would be sent to prison for his dishonesty. She added that if he was incarcerated, she would be moving to Washington permanently with their three children, leaving him behind. But things would only get more rocky and more convoluted when it would later come to light that Anna had indeed been seeing another man, but he described their relationship as being at the level of dating rather than intimate. He added that he'd spent Thanksgiving with Anna in Dublin, but this man's name has not been made public and he's since declined to further comment on the case. But if I were Brian, I'd be getting my money back from that private investigator. But then there was the matter of Anna's life insurance policies, which were worth over $2.7 million and all listed Brian as the sole beneficiary. If Brian had indeed ended Anna's life, he would certainly stand to gain a lot of money. But the defense argued that Brian had more than enough money on his own and that the payouts from these policies would have made little difference to his financial situation. So for an insurance payout to be the motive behind her disappearance, well, that theory just didn't hold much water. Next, the prosecution focused on the Google searches that had been found on their son's iPad. They claimed that this was clear evidence that Brian had either planned the crime well ahead of time or that he'd been looking for a way of disposing of Anna's remains after he'd carried out the heinous act. They revealed that he'd also searched Google using phrases that included best hacksaw to dismember and can you identify a body with broken teeth. They also pointed to CCTV footage of Brian as he was purchasing rugs, cleaning products, a tarp, a Tyvek suit, and a hatchet at the Home Depot in Rockland. It's just so incredibly nuts that this man just walked out the front door of a Home Depot while carrying all these items and no one even batted an eye. Whether he was under investigation or not, this would be suspicious for just about anyone to make off with. Investigators also revealed that Brian was captured by CCTV cameras in Abington and Brockton while disposing of more than a dozen large trash bags at a complex about 45 minutes away from the family's home. 
Unfortunately, those trash bags could never be retrieved as they were picked up by trash collectors and incinerated. But that very same day, he performed yet another internet search for the phrases, what happens to hair on a body? And can baking soda mask or make a body smell good? But the defense claimed that these searches were meaningless as far as the charges against their client were concerned. They stated that while some of the searches were suspicious, he'd also performed a search for how to set up a charitable corporation to give away lottery winnings tax-free. They argued that since he'd never won the lottery and had never set up a charitable trust, the searches could not be used to prove that he'd done so, and hence the problematic searches could not be used to prove that he'd taken the life of his wife either, which is a very valid point. But the detectives hit back with further evidence that had been found which centered on additional internet searches that Brian had performed. He searched how to mix ammonia, how long a person should be missing before they're declared deceased, how to clean up a crime scene, and how to dispose of a body. Furthermore, he searched how to remove a SIM card from a phone, the locations of different apartment complexes in Brockton, as well as the names of crime scene cleanup companies, how blood is detected at a crime scene, and how one would go about removing blood stains from concrete. When asked about these searches during questioning, Brian quite unbelievably blamed them on his son since the tablet belonged to him. But he was unable to explain how a six-year-old child could perform those searches without making a single spelling error. This was a question Brian couldn't answer. During Brian's interviews with police, investigators referred to a police search that had been conducted of Brian's Volvo, which was found with the seats down. It had also been lined on the inside with plastic, and upon closer inspection, investigators believed that he'd recently vacuumed the carpet. Shortly after this search was carried out, he traveled to his mother's house in Swampscott, where he placed 10 trash bags into a dumpster, located in the apartment complex where she lived. Those bags were retrieved by police, who then discovered the cleaning supplies, hacksaw, towels, and a receipt for a COVID-19 vaccine. But the most crucial was the discovery of some of Anna's personal belongings. The bags were also found to contain a pair of boots that Anna was last seen wearing as well as a part of one of her necklaces, a COVID-19 vaccination card in her name, her Hermes watch, car keys, her coat, and her Prada purse. This resulted in the house being searched and the bloody knife being found in the basement along with the further evidence. When DNA tests were done on the Tyvek suit that he'd purchased, it was found to contain traces of Anna's DNA. But the defense argued that this was not enough to prove that Brian had ended her life, since the match wasn't considered complete. Her DNA legitimately could have ended up on that suit for a million different reasons. Then there was the fact that Brian was still under house arrest thanks to the art fraud charges that he'd been accused of. He'd been given permission to take his children to school, but was otherwise advised to stay home. When CCTV footage was discovered showing him shopping for supplies in different stores, it became obvious that he was willing to break the conditions of his house arrest to cover up what he had done, a seemingly desperate act that he would not have performed under normal circumstances. The court claimed that Brian went to even further lengths to cover his tracks. They referred to an email that had been sent to the police in Cohasset, which stated that Anna had been abducted. It went on to claim that Anna had, quote, messed up, but this was never further explained, and that she would never be seen again unless a payment of $127,000 was made. But this letter contained no directions of where the money was to be dropped off and no further emails were ever received, which would be truly strange in an actual abduction case. To me, it kind of makes the whole thing seem like a poorly thought out hoax. As the trial ticked on, Brian's bank account continued to slowly run down and even having to pay exorbitant amounts of money in legal fees. As he eventually fell into poverty, Brian could no longer afford a private attorney. This prompted his defense attorney to withdraw from the case, and he was provided with a court-appointed lawyer, only making matters worse for Brian, but better for the prosecution. Now, considering all of this unfolded in 2023, just last year at the time of making this documentary, the court case hasn't been fully settled yet. But I think we know 100% how this is going to end. But for Brian, well, it seems like he's beginning to grow desperate, and he began to steal money from those closest to him, most notably his deceased father. 
In 2023, some of his family members contacted the police to report that just before Brian was taken into custody, he had destroyed his father's will after which he went into his home and started removing some valuable items, which he then sold. Now, why his family waited all this time to report the crime, I haven't been able to figure that out. The timeline of some of these events can get pretty murky when a case is being reported by dozens of different news outlets, but my best guess is that he must have destroyed his father's will within just a few days of being taken into custody, as the first mention of this missing will comes from January 10th, and Brian was arrested by police on January 8th. Anyway, among the items Brian allegedly stole were his father's car, pieces of art, rugs, and several pieces of jewelry. He even went as far as attempting to sell his father's house, but obviously couldn't do this since it was still registered in his father's name. His family pleaded with him to provide them with just a simple list of all the items that he stole, but he claimed he couldn't do this because he was in prison, which is just hilarious, but obviously not in a good way. The case dragged on for a long time, and ultimately his family decided to drop the charges against him since they were making very little progress, and had decided that there was no point in spending more money on attempting to recover the items, since they were now long gone and likely would never be tracked down. In fact, it would probably cost more in legal fees and frustration than the items themselves would have even been worth. Now, while it seems obvious to most of us that Brian did take the life of Anna, he does maintain that he's innocent and he has no idea what happened to her after leaving for her flight on that New Year's Day. As for the couple's three children, Anna's friends have asked the state to allow them to stay together and that they be placed in homes with people who are friends of the family. After Brian was arrested, they were placed in the custody of his mother, but they were then relocated to state custody, which is just so heartbreaking to hear. They added that separating the children would only cause them further trauma and reiterated that it would be in their best interest to remain together in the care of people who had their best interest at heart. The state responded by saying that it's their usual policy to try and keep siblings together unless there's a specific reason for one or more children to be placed separately, which seemingly isn't the case here. So essentially, no one really even knows where the kids are at this point, and the state couldn't really care less about their placement. At least that's what I make out of all this. So I'll admit, I tend to be a bit biased when children get involved, but I can't stand the way that the legal system seems to treat children who've been orphaned. In the end, there are a lot of unknowns in this case, but one certainty is that the true victims of Brian's actions are his children, who will eventually have to learn what their father did to their family. Anna's story is unfortunately already over. Her suffering is done and what Brian may have done to her, it can't be reversed. But the pain that these children are now being forced to live with is just unimaginable. And it's unfolding right now as we speak. The fact that Brian has continued to plead his innocence and draw this whole thing out while showing no remorse or even sadness at Anna's disappearance, it speaks volumes. One can only wonder whether his children will ever be able to forgive him for depriving them of a mother, who by all accounts loved her children above all others and who would have done anything to ensure their happiness. As it stands, there's nothing any of us can really do other than stand on the sidelines and wait for the inevitable sentencing of Brian Walsh. I just hope his kids make it out okay. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that join button below to help support the channel and see new videos long before everyone else does. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.